I'm trending just... more to the latter in terms of actually you don't have the, the power to, to stop the economy in the way that you did. So therefore, is there a danger that you've rather well, you know, look, over, we'll see. over a chance well, wages, to ask? Wages have been falling in this country for 30 years. They've not kept up with inflation. At the same time, private profits have really not exceeded inflation. There was some research done by Unite that said the FTSE 350 companies, their profits are up 73% since 2019. I gave, same, I, I gave but, the figures but, for, for let, train drivers of getting a 39% pay rise at the over the last time, 10 I mean, years at when the same inflation's time, run at 20%. At the so same that's time, double inflation. At the same time, there's been a 73% increase in private profits for people at the top. I mean, you, 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 the belt. Specific to rail, they're not but being that's paid. I, the point I'm making is everyone in this country is feeling a pinch. Enough is enough, and it's a bad time that people made it clear where they stand on this. And I think people across the economy, nurses, Postal workers, railway workers are all about to stand together and say, we deserve a pay rise in this country. And that's coming. So it's not about whether or not we're just as uh, effective as we were three years ago. There is a bigger thing happening in this country that people don't seem to realise. And that is people are not prepared to accept any longer that they've got to continue to be made poorer so that people at the top can continue to rake in profits. <coughs> that's over. And that is going to change over the next period. Okay, and the last point, which is saying, Mr. Morris, well, just to make sure it's on the record, if I can just, you could perhaps shoot on it in, Mr. Whelan, is around the legislative changes that have uh, either been brought in or are being um, proposed. Yeah. Um, on, on the agency side of things, mm. I mean, as you've said, the highly skilled workers, I mean, I think I've said this before, I can't see how that will actually make any difference to um, replacing highly skilled um, workers who work on the railway because you can't bring an agency worker in. I mean, do you feel it would be ineffective as, as a change? I think it would be ineffective, but I think it's shocking that the answer to the cost of living crisis coming from government is to criminalise dissent. Mm. I think that's outrageous. We rank free on the International TUC Global Index for Freedoms for Trade Unions. We have got some interesting company in that bracket, let me tell yeah, you. You've, you've that says we have got regular violations of trade union freedoms in this country. And that is a disgrace. We're meant to be a democracy. We're meant to be a free country. We're meant to have the right to bargain freely for our members in a free market with employers. But instead, as soon as people stand up and say they want a decent uh, shake in a deal for working people, we've got a government that wants to criminalise that. And that's wrong. Okay. Don't worry about whether it's going to be effective. It's just outrageous that that's the answer to the cost of living crisis. Mr Whelan, I want to give you the chance to put that on yeah, your views on the record. brief points. In relation to your statement, we took 28% for DOO. No, we didn't. That was separate, settled separately. Um, but go and look at the agreement and I'll send it to you. Um, on top of that, this isn't about power. This is about the people that we represent and what they want us to do and how they feel impacted. Right? No worker rushes to go on strike. No worker wants to lose money and no worker wants to receive the levels of abuse that we receive, We're particularly in the transport sector, when we go on strike. So, therefore, it is a last resort. The trouble is these issues happen when they happen. It isn't because of when you're at the height of your power or the, 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 the weakness of your leverage at a point in time. It's about when the situation happens that drives that dispute to occur. <coughs> I'll make that quite clear. And as for scab charter that you've created or the government's created and passed recently, that's what it will be. And the real problem in industry like ours, there's still people not being spoken to scabbed in 1955 and 1982. And of course, scab labour can only work for scab management. And what it will do, it will impact and destroy the industrial relations of this industry going forward, where 97% of the time we work in partnership with our employers, which is what people seem to forget. So anybody who employs any scab labour, if it's unsafe, right, we won't be working with them. I'll make that quite clear. I will put that on the record. And afterwards, anybody who's employed any scab labour, we will look at them as our employers in a different way. You've used the word scab. Huh? Anybody who breaks the strike and crosses the picket line. We're not in school. Okay, let, 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 me, let me just finish up. So you've obviously used well, quite, so emotive, find it. No, you quite it? emotive terms there to call them scab. So does that mean that, and it's quite an intimidating term as well, so are you saying it's not just a question it won't work alongside them, but there will be intimidation to ensure they don't we take We do not intimidate post. anybody. We're not advising that and not advocating that. I said the difficulties anyone, will be. Where it's unsafe, we will not work with them. That's what anyone, I said. That was my actual statement. If any reasonable person heard what you just said, when you used the scab about four or five times, I would, I would take it as quite intimidatory myself. 
Well, I think if you look at the newspapers and how it's been defined and how it's been reported, it's been called Scabs Charter. I'm reflecting what, how it's been terminology has been used elsewhere. Never heard the term yeah, used either. on the agency Never workforce. But let's also ask about minimum uh, service levels um, and, and the proposal to bring uh, those in. Uh, they're widely used on the, on the continent. Um, is that something that you would sort of feel as um, emotive about as you do with regard to the agency legislation? Or do you think they've, they've got a place if, if it's good enough for Europe, good enough for the UK? I'm not sure how it can practically work, if I'm honest, logistically or otherwise. Have people still got the right of protest in the UK? That's been diminished recently by certain legislation that we passed. If there was a picket line and somebody who was um, obligated to work refused to work that picket line, what would happen to them? I've no knowledge of how this could operate in a realistic and other way. Would it end up exacerbating strife and making it longer and more difficult? Quite possibly. Okay, and Mr. Deputy, again, I should give you the chance to, to state your views on. I, I don't you know. think minimum service uh, legislation will work here. Um, we won't cooperate with it in any event um, as a trade union. And I think these laws that are being talked about to further weaken the ability of trade unions and really what we're talking about here is taking power away from working class people to address what is already an imbalance of power in where they work. Uh, we've all seen what happens when uh, powerful uh, people uh, in companies want to take uh, liberties with working class people and it happens all the time. We're here to address that imbalance and if we have our ability to do that taken away we will have to find other ways to do that. And I do regard people that cross a picket line and breaking a strike. I do regard those people as scabs. And you've got to appreciate, working class people have got a different morality around stuff like this. My father was a seafarer, his father was a railway worker. None of us have ever crossed a picket line, none of us ever will cross a picket line. And that carries with it all kinds of connotations. There's only two sides in a dispute and you have to pick which one you're on. You either stand with people who are struggling to get a fair deal, or you're on the side of people taking a kick in and being made unemployed. There's no middle ground in this, there's no you know, sitting on the fence. If you sit on the fence, you only get splinters where you don't want them. So my view is the legislation is uncalled for. There's no need for it. It's a wrong thing to try and further weaken trade unions in a country where we've probably got the worst anti-trade union legislation in Western Europe. It's authoritarian nonsense. And then if you really want to stop people taking strike action, what you need to do is put money in their pockets in a cost of living crisis, because that's what's causing strike action. It is not uh, that trade unions have got the ability to strike. I've just listed a whole range of companies where we've made settlements and everything's fine. In, in these companies where we're having operational expenditure slashed, jobs being taken out of the industry, wages being attacked and terms and conditions being torn up, that is where you've got strike action. So if you want to solve this, you need to have a fair settlement for people in the industry, not bring more, tr more uh, laws in to criminalise dissent. OK, well, look, thank you. Last, last word to you. I'm very grateful for all the time you've given us. We've gone way over time, but you've given us a, a lot of evidence, so we're grateful to that. And we hope that uh, negotiations will continue. There's an offer on the table. You've, you've, you've given a sort of hint as to where that could go. Uh, we'll now find out from the next panel where they think it will go themselves. Mr Wheeler, Mr Dempsey, thanks, thanks very, very much. much. Thank you very much indeed. Very best wishes.